Tonight on the Goblin's Corner, we're going to interview a proper mad scientist. Proper indeed. Do you have a hankering to see creatures and all sorts of models created out of foam or otherwise? Then join us this evening as we speak with legendary effects and creature creator Russ Adams. That's how we roll. 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 Welcome to the Goblin's Corner. My name is Eric. And I'm Matt. And tonight. We're speaking to Russ Adams, a creature effect specialist. That's right. Russ Adams is an effects artist and creature designer best known for his work on Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge and is the founder of Escape Design FX. Russ has a wide skill set due to many years working with Hollywood productions as well as independent film and theater. He also has a badass minotaur, which is the kind of reason we have him here today. Russ, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. So... We got to talk about the Minotaur, which is the whole reason I got you on this show. So I want you guys to picture this for you playing the home game here is we're at Dragon Con. We walk into the Hall of Fame where people are signing autographs and stuff. And I see this three foot Minotaur that is incredible. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I ask these famous, screw these famous people. I'm going to, I want to check out this Minotaur and I end up talking <laughs> to, I believe it was your wife, uh, about the Minotaur and then we start talking together, right? And and I was like, I've got to get you on this show because we've got a lot of crafters uh, in our as our listener base, as well as you know, we do a little bit of crafting as well, some of the stuff over here. And gaming and crafting kind of go hand in hand. And I thought, what better person to talk about crafting and just making you know just really cool creatures and monsters than a person who actually does this for a living? So. That's kind of how we we started this whole thing out. Sounds good. Yeah, oh, I, I, I hate to be anal, but I, I just had like one. It's it's forty two inches, not not three feet. So I just I'm so, to... uh, forty two <laughs> inches. <laughs> well, there I'm you go. Sorry, that was hey, no, that was that's true. fair. That Didn't want to give the Minotaur a complex here, so we'll... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you missed six so, inches of Minotaur on I that. Can't believe, you know, it's, that's that's true. That's very true. He's a very impressive Minotaur. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate Eight. it. See, I can't do math either, but it's okay. <laughs> we broke Matt. Look at this. He's, yeah. he's I'm dying. sorry, my, man. No, just, it's okay. You know, my brain went, it size, went sideways. You know, matters. Uh, size matters. Size matters. Yeah. Size yeah. matters. Yeah. Exact, exactly. My brain dropped into the gutter for a second, and I was like, where do I go with this? <laughs> so, Russ, let's talk about how you got started with creature creation. Uh, it's kind of a weird story i just you know um a lot of us that are they call us creature kids you know um who came up in like the 80s and you know there, there was no you know uh information out there that was readily available i mean this stuff was top secret i mean no one was sharing any of it so we would tear things apart and you know like check out things like fangoria magazine looking for that one photo of the in process build that we could just you know kind of attack it like like you know like we were casing a, a bank for a robbery you know we just like we'd be in there with a magnifying glass just to see what was going on um and so basically it started with me watching an episode of mr rogers neighborhood and you know he's all about pretend and trying to make kids understand that uh you know that this wasn't real and he was interviewing Lou Ferrigno and they were showing how they transformed him into the Incredible Hulk for the original series. And uh, I was watching that. I was hooked as a little kid. I was just hooked. So I started tearing things apart, which really made my parents happy. All the, all the <laughs> games with little motors in it and stuff. Sure. Uh, I started tearing apart. But we also didn't have a whole lot of money, which is kind of another characteristic for creature kids is – you know, we would build our own toys because, you know, you would covet like the Optimus Prime uh, characters and stuff, but you couldn't afford them. Um, yeah. And so you'd make your own version of them, starting with paper, then with wood. Basically, that's just how it developed. So you had Transformer taste, but GoBot budget. <laughs> Not even a GoBot budget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the paper bot budget was basically what we <laughs> what we had, but. You know, it, it it was it was fun because you got to you you don't realize it when you're that age and you're making things transform like you see 
you know, because it was pointless to have a toy that was just the robot, you know, if it didn't transform. So you had to figure that out, too. So basically out of a block of wood, a couple, you know, scrap pieces of wood, you're creating these transformers and you don't even realize it, but you're learning engineering skills and design skills and things like that. And it's like I use algebra all the time, but if you put me in an algebra class, I'm going to fail it. I understand that very well. <laughs> I get that. It's it's interesting how much you learn trying to build something as an artist. I, I always find it really interesting where, you know, you might be making something out of clay. You might be making something out of resin or, you know, what have you, right? And there's chemistry involved. Like you said, there's, there's math involved, engineering. You've got to think about things in a 3D way. You also have to think about things in a linear path because you have to, it, there's multiple procedures and steps involved. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of know-how. It's not just I slap something together and call it a day. And so there's definitely like a process. Uh, do you have a particular oh, yeah. process with when you create like a creature? It's kind of different for each one because it's all it's all R&D until you get it right. You know, that whole fake it till you make it thing. You know, um, you know, you were talking about like, you know, the chemistry thing, knowing, you know, knowing the rules of how to mix silicone or, or fiberglass resin, but then how to break those rules to what we do is like hot kick things. Cause I, I don't know a single FX artist who has an attention span longer than like this. So we don't want to wait the standard amount of time. We want that thing to be ready and pull out of that mold immediately. So you hot kick it, which, you know, can start a fire. What, what is, what is hot kicking? Hot kicking is when, okay. say you have two chemicals um, and you've got to mix them uh, and a and B together. But a specific part of B says, hey, listen, these are supposed to be like one to one. And you've decided, you know what, like in fiberglass, you're supposed to, you know, for a cup of resin, you add so much hardener and that's it. But we'll sometimes add three times the amount of hardener, knowing full well that there's a shrinkage issue, but also that it heats up even faster. But you get your part quicker. And it's like the difference of getting what you need in 24 hours versus maybe two hours, you know? So hmm. it's knowing how it's going to affect the end result, being okay with that and breaking the rules to get something faster, you know, but knowing all those, those issues, because you've made those mistakes in the past, you know, how it's going to twist and warp and, Oh my God, if there's too much humidity in a room, is this thing going to foam out instead of, cast resin or are you going to have something that appears to be like um, like polyurethane foam block because the way the resin ballooned out and stuff stuff like that math that's how i get you is that math oh geometry holy crap some of the hardest things when when we're trying to create a creature and you know you need to start with something like a ball you know just a sphere you know how do i make a sphere i mean it's a challenge. I mean, there's a formula that I have setting aside. As a matter of fact, it's on my phone. You know, I know what the formula is so that I can then, you know, create those, the proper strips, those um, weird eye-like looking strips, how many of those I need to complete the sphere, making sure that they're all the same. I mean, it's this weird amount of geometry. And like I said, I'd never be able to pass these classes in high school or, or even when I was getting my master's. I, I, I couldn't pass those math classes. I mean, I barely got through <laughs> But, you know, yeah, uh, somehow you're doing it every day and you don't even realize it. Geometry I was good at because it was such a functional math. Algebra, once once it started dropping into theoretical math, my brain was just like, mm, yeah. nah, this, this doesn't seem like it's for me. I have a science degree, so I mean, all right, amidst the other ones, but I, so I have to take <laughs> a lot of math. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I don't use my science degrees anymore, but... <laughs> But you got them. But I got them. Yeah, they look they're, nice. They're, they, they, they're on the wall. It's impressive, man. I mean, science degree. I mean, you know, it's like holy crap. We got we got a badass in the room. You know, it's like, now <laughs> there's a reason it's a BS. Like it stands. It there stands for BS for a reason. So let's say you're an aspiring creature builder. Let's say you've never made anything from scratch. What are maybe a couple of easy things that you could start out with if you're a beginner? If you're just getting into it, um, one of the best things to play with is foam. 
I mean, it's cheap. Um, there's, it's readily available. I mean, basically everything from cosplayers to special effects, artists, creature designers, um, prop makers, we're all using like, so it's a phone that that's most commonly, uh, you know, uh, suggested uh, the name is uh, EVA phone, but it, uh, when we're, when we're talking about it in a studio, um, setting it's L 200, it's basically the same thing. One just comes in smaller sheets that are a little more user friendly. You can get them just about anywhere. Whereas L 200, there's like only specialized places, foam, uh, factory, uh, that will like outlets that'll sell that, you know, and mark it up in a ridiculous, ridiculous, uh, you know, number, but, um, I would say play with some foam because by playing with the EVA foam, you're learning a bunch of different skills. You're learning how to pattern, which is, which is critical. I mean, I do just as much sewing as I do sculpting or casting or painting. Um, you know, uh, you, you, you learn how to bend space and get it to hold position. And, uh, and it's really inexpensive material. Like I think like, uh, you go down to home Depot, not home Depot. Um, you go down to Harbor freight and pick up these floor mats, which is EVA foam for like, I think it's like nine 99 and there's like a pack of four and they're basically two feet by two feet. Um, and just go nuts for 10 bucks. I mean, and some glue, you know, and, you know, you're learning, you know, by screwing around with that stuff. Go to yard sales and pick up old yoga mats. Yeah, yeah. you can totally pick up <laughs> yoga mats. And you can make oh, everything yeah. out of it. They make people make helmets out of it. Oh, yeah. You can watch YouTube and, and like, YouTube's great for stuff like this because you just fall down a rabbit hole in terms of, like, making props and stuff like that, particularly for, like, Dragon Con and such. Mm -hmm. And they'll have, like, guns that they've made out of just foam like weapons oh, we, yeah. we come from the larping universe so so we we made a lot of stuff with uh what was it matt the the pool noodle foam yeah oh yeah um you got open cell foam you've got uh i use a lot of upholstery foam like i don't know if people would would realize that but when i'm doing these giant bigfoot suits gorilla suits uh werewolf suits you have to create um a muscle structure underneath there an artificial muscle structure so you're 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 using a combination of the EVA foam or L two hundred and the upholstery foam and some styrofoam because you got to keep the weight down to carve out these muscles and get them to move on a like um on a spandex track so that they they move naturally mm -hmm. and like I don't think a lot of people think of you know, like how do they get that muscle structure underneath there because it slides underneath the fur and stuff and actually looks like muscle movement um. All that stuff is incredibly useful. Um, styrofoam, upholstery foam, basically whatever foam. Um, AB foam, you can mix that stuff together. It gets a little more expensive at that point. And you need like things like molds and stuff. But basically foam is inexpensive. And I mean, so, you know, it, it's a subtractive material in, in that, you know, if you cut something wrong, I mean, you can glue it together and fix it or whatever. But if you want it to be polished, you, you, you have to, you know, get to the point where, you know, you're going to you've worked out the R&D and you're 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 able to cut those things properly and get them to, to bend the space and everything to make them work. But um, but there's nothing uh, cheaper than playing with foam and having a blast at it. That's cool. I, I like messing around with just like different things like that. And of course, we do a lot of cardboard suits and stuff for our kids, which is. You know, if you got a cardboard box, man, you can make a uh, you can make a fun suit or some kind of cardboard superheroes. Yeah, for Dragon Con. Oh, yeah. Well, well, my <laughs> kids, my kids for last year for Halloween were uh, Firebenders from the Avatar cartoon, and I literally just made the Firebender armor out of cardboard. But you could do the same thing with EVA foam, and it would actually look probably a lot better than what I did. But but it's a great place to start, right? Yeah, exactly. I didn't I didn't even think about cardboard, but yeah, cardboard is 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 great because you can use things like masking tape to hold it together instead of with foam we use there's a bunch of different stuff you can use but um but i had some of it here we use this stuff called barge and it's uh contact cement and mm. it is really toxic stuff i mean it's the stuff that they use to put leather uh sorry soles on the bottom of shoes and stuff to hold it together 
a lot of saddle makers will use it to hold saddle, you know, leather together and stuff. But uh, it's it's really, really nasty stuff. Uh, but if you're using cardboard, um, you could get the same results and just use some masking tape to kind of, you know, hold everything together. Um, the cool thing about, you know, I, I've seen Iron Man suits, incredibly beautiful Iron Man suits and raw cardboard that I would I was like this one guy I was begging him not to paint it. Don't don't finish that thing at all. I mean, the fact that you have a raw cardboard Iron Man suit that looks like it's film ready. God, I mean, it was incredible to look at. I and it, and it moved properly and wow, just cardboard, man. I mean, it was it was it was a full size suit. I, I geek out over the weird, you know, it's just, you know, but yeah, that raw cardboard, it kind of like, I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent. I apologize, but it reminds me of when I was working with, uh, uh, the, the Weber state university on, uh, an Elizabethan gown that we had essentially created this incredibly intricate Elizabethan gown out of muslin, just raw muslin. Uh, it was just this off white, you know, and it, and it was the most amazing looking thing when we were all done with it. And it kind of harkened back to that when I saw that, you know, that Iron Man suit. I would have loved to see. I would have loved to seen the uh, that Iron Man, that cardboard Iron Man. That would have been awesome. That would have been great. It, it was incredible. I think you can still find it on on YouTube and like searches on Google. Um, I didn't see it at Dragon Con. It was um, it was it was a it was a build that somebody was doing. And had I had the money to pick that thing up, I would have totally rescued it from any kind of finishing work because I, I would have loved to have that thing on a mannequin just sitting, you know, in my office and just looking at it on a daily basis, completely, you know, mesmerized by it doesn't take these incredible chemicals and, you know, CNC routers and, you know, 3D printers and all this stuff to create something amazing like that. It took that guy a box knife, some masking tape, and a lot of patience. <laughs> yeah. but, and I think, you know, that's what it comes down to is the, the, what is it? The three store, the three corner, the, the, the triangle of crafting. It's either quality, time, or money. And yeah. you can only ever short shift one of those. I am glad you brought that up, though, because it, you know, regardless of whether you're working with dungeon terrain like we do or, you're doing some kind of fine work like doing a, uh, a costume for Dragon Con or you're making stuff on movies. You don't always have to have the latest and greatest machine to make something. And in fact, sometimes, like you said, a box knife and a little bit of grit will get you through things. This, one of the things I see a lot is you'll have these crafters who have all of the toys and at somewhere along the line, they kind of make it harder for people who are trying to get into it because you know if i look at that i might be very um hesitant to because there's a lot of uh, like stuff i gotta buy right and so you you think oh man the entry level for this is just super huge but really you start with something like you said start with some eva foam start with just something that's simple and start playing with that and then build your your materials as time progresses this isn't exactly a big secret, but um, whenever it does come up, I like to talk about it. So you guys remember Men in Black? There was yes. a scene. It lasted. I, I don't even know if it was two full seconds, maybe less, where, you know, Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones walk past this bubble creature um, in the uh, the Men in Black you know, place they're coming in and they're doing, I think they're doing like food inspection. Do you have anything to, to declare? Blah, blah, blah. Right. Making it like an airport. Um, and there's this bubble creature and it's, it's this gelatin looking thing. And it was created by the gods of special effects, you know, uh, the Stan Winston studio and their amazing, uh, you know, uh, artists, but it was basically a couple of bags a couple of boxes of kitchen bags and they used this <laughs> weld thing where they where they were able to cut those pieces those geometric shapes and stuff but the way they cut it it would melt the plastic together and create a scene and then they just inflated it painted it and airbrushed it from inside and out and stuck a guy in there that you couldn't really see and 
I don't know how many tens of thousands of dollars. I, I've, I've heard, you know, around like a hundred plus thousand dollars for this creature that was on air for something like um, less than two seconds. It was in the film and it cost them 20, 30 bucks in kitchen bags to put this thing together. And if I remember correctly, uh, Billy, and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to remember Billy's last name. Billy was high as a kite when he came up with the concept and he was blowing, um, uh, he was smoking and blowing it into a garbage bag, tying it off and letting it float away up in the rafters of the studio. And, uh, you know, that's how he came up with the idea. And it was just <laughs> like, they made so much money off that one creature and it cost them nothing to make nothing but time. That's Hollywood guys. Yep. <laughs> that's it. That's it. You know, and that's a sad thing because, you know, you put that kind of effort, that level of effort into something and make something amazing. And it just goes in the garbage. Like people don't realize that the suits that I make that I charge ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars for, I have to be OK with the fact that someone's going to wear it. And when they wear it, they're going to sweat inside it. Then it's going to become a biohazard, you know, so you can't just sell that to somebody else. Now it's got, you know, it's got um, humid fluids in it drying and getting all kinds of nasty because it's eventually it's essentially a sponge you know mm. and you can hang it up and air it up and, and disinfect it as much as you can but the same actor is getting in that the next day so he's only kind of like stewing in his own juices not somebody else's and when the shot's done and when the film is over it goes in the garbage unless someone rescues it and sticks it on a mannequin and you know they should have a waiver on it and saying hey listen please <laughs> for the love of god don't put this thing on going to get infantago or something, you know, um, but it goes in the garbage. So, you know, these guys, you know, at Stan Winston Studios, you know, putting together this garbage bag creature, you know, knowing full well is going in the garbage. I mean, now they've reduced their footprint of how much trash they created for this creature and only spent 20 bucks, whatever, on those bags, <laughs> on those kitchen garbage bags. And created something that they made hundreds of thousands of dollars off of. You know, it's just those garbage bags were going to end up in the landfill anyway. Yeah, that's incredible. Exactly. It, they probably <laughs> they probably took the prop and you know put the food from the uh, from the food truck in the prop just to throw away. They probably did. And you know, I mean, it's just you know, you get on. There's so little se sentimentality that goes on with some of these pieces that we create. You know, you're almost in shock and horror and. And if you're not in shock and horror, then, you know, you're a veteran of the industry. It's <laughs> the noobs that come in and they see that they've just sliced and diced up their hard work. And they're just like they're ready to cry, you know, and it's like, oh, you must you must be new. <laughs> it's sad, <laughs> but it's all know. for the story. All for the story. That's though. it. So story is a lot of what we talk about. How much does the the story and the theme come into play when you're creating a creature? It actually it's quite a bit because, you know, a lot of times you'll have the script in front of you and you're pulling apart all the aspects that are related to the creature, its movements, why it's like that. Maybe you even fabricate some of your own backstory in there to help move the process along. Um but specifically, when you're creating something of your very own, um, like if we harken back real quick to that television show I was on, uh, the, the Jim Henson Creature Shop Challenge, you know, they would tell us, this is the creature we want you to make. This is what it does. Go. And you have to figure out how to make it work. And the backstory um, can describe everything from why it's the color it is, the mating rituals. You know, how it attracts a mate, um, you know, its speed, the way it attacks prey, if it is prey, the way it escapes. Uh, all of that stuff needs to be rolling around in your head, even if it's not in a script form, because that's going to determine how your character moves and acts and um, and its presence. So, you know, uh, we would have to do that stuff now. To be completely honest, a lot of happened you know because you're creating these creatures um and you have something like 10 hours a day uh for two days three days if you're lucky to create a creature you know um for essentially to be camera ready and on set and it was a nightmare i mean a lot of people were like hey you had more time than that no no we did not 
Um, you didn't even have that full 10 hours because they're pulling you out to do interviews and crap like that. So in the midst of creating this stuff, you might make a mistake here and there. And you might, uh, you know, like a friend of mine, and I, I love Lex to death. She's she's like my British little sister. Um, she was on the show with us and she ran out of time and she couldn't finish a creature. I think it was uh, episode four. Um, and so she started this backstory where little bits of the creature were, you know, disappearing. You know, it was part of the story, you know, and so it didn't have any eyelids. Why doesn't it have eyelids, Lex? I mean, she's a professional. We're all professionals, you know, but, you know, you only have so much time and you're doing right. this stuff in that particular episode by ourselves. So she was running out of time. Um, and I, I, I'm going to throw this off. It was a lot of having to do with their ridiculous mech setup that they that didn't fit. The parts just didn't freaking fit. Um, and so they would waste a lot of time with that. And so her eyelids are missing and stuff. It was, she's she's turned this thing into um, the subject of a magician's um you know, who was, uh, uh, Donald Faison, um, his, 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 his faulty, um, magical abilities and he's teleporting her, but only pieces are going at a time. And that's how Lex created a backstory to cover her ass, you know, for essentially a creature that didn't get finished. And it was friggin' brilliant. I that's mean, great. you know, we all knew it was, <laughs> but it was brilliant. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a perfect way to cover that up. So backstory is important. Um, it's also important to cover your ass when you're creating something and you screw up. This sounds exactly like being a DM when you're creating <laughs> creatures. Half of it's BS. Exactly. Oh, yeah. It, it, yeah. Seriously, half of it's And the other half is thinking about consequence of actions when it comes to the story, right? So, like, Matt and yeah. I, we've got tons of episodes where we make creatures for people because we love making monsters, right? And so... For example, we have a, uh, a beholder shark, which is one of my favorite creatures that we've come up with so far, which is a beholder and a shark all in one. It's almost as good as my phase mosasaur, which is a mosasaur that phases back and forth from reality. <laughs> but we have to think about stuff like, hey, how does it eat? How does it breed? And, you know, we usually just give it the bullet points and then the rest of it's BS, which right. is exactly how most DMs work. Or if they don't, they should. Because that's the fun part of being a DM. You know, you gotta do a little improv. And it's nice to hear that the physical creation of creatures also requires thinking through the consequence of actions and a little bit of <laughs> improv. <laughs> yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. It's uh you know, I do like the the phasing uh Moses. Is it sort of like how how it explains Nessie? I mean, that you can't find her. Yeah, you know what a phase spider is in D&D? It's like a spider that lives on the ethereal plane and just kind of phases into reality and bites people and then phases back out of reality. Well, I thought that was really cool, and I wanted a mosasaur that did that. And you just, you're just you just walking along, and this mosasaur pops out of nowhere, bites your head off, and just phases back into the ethereal plane. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's mostly because we're terrible people. I mean, you know, it, <laughs> hey. my players like it. You know, there's always the X factor. You know, you, you have to be ready. You know, <laughs> that's right. Got to be ready in for anything. life and in D and D. You know. <laughs> so we've been talking about props. We've been talking about creature models. We've been talking a little bit about games. This is where a tabletop show. Obviously, we concentrate a lot about that. What is it about creatures in general, or I would even say just effects in general, that you think really add? to any type of story. You could be movies or, or even visual aids in the theater or props. What do you think about the, the creativity and the craft that really adds to stories? Harkening back to what we were just talking about, about the, uh, the backstory and everything. I mean, if it's, if, it's, if it's a character that is just imaginary, right? And you're having to uh, visualize it in your mind's eye to, to make it work, there... It sounds like, you know, you say something like werewolf or whatever, and not everybody's going to see a werewolf the exact same way. And so by giving it these details, you're now pulling everyone onto the same, you know, sheet of paper. Everyone understands that this isn't like some uh, Twilight uh, piece of crap, you know, <laughs> where it's just a big dog, you know, um, you know, or I guess that was the same. With Tell me how you feel about that, Russ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing I hate more than Twilight 
ruined vampires for generations to come. Werewolves. You know what? If if I had if I had some alcohol in me, this would go on way longer. Anyway, <laughs> so you know, but I mean, everyone sees a wolf man. You know, uh, yeah. the old uh, version of uh, I mean, that's basically a werewolf. I mean, different variations. You know, everyone has to be on the same page. So the more detail that's poured into these these characters helps pull people in. It's basically the same. The only thing is, is it's a cheat. What I do. You know, because where you guys are creating a character that needs to be uh, fleshed out among however many people are, are there with you and everyone has to see it the same way through description. I just show them, you know, and that's I think that's a lot of the problem where people are reading books, you know, um, and then they see the uh, the movie version and they don't quite like it. Because what they saw in their mind's eye wasn't what we had created in our mind's eye and brought mm -hmm. into the world uh, and put on the screen. So that's a lot of the the aspect of it that uh, that's it, it sort of causes that that animosity, you know, when you're mm -hmm. talking about things like, you know, oh, the movie wasn't as good as the book and blah, blah, blah. That's because you're allowed to create all that stuff in your head and make it even grander then you could possibly create in the real world. So when yeah. we bring it into the real world, we try really hard, you know, to, to make that magic happen, but you're showing them instead of telling them. And, you know, we've all heard, you know, stories are best, you know, through, you know, the whole, you know, telling the story and stuff like that and, and crafting, you know, the description um, as opposed to here it is, you know, <laughs> so what we do is a bit of a cheat, in my opinion, and what you guys do is way more uh, in depth and primordial. You know, it really gets you know the uh, the, the the people involved and in, and in seeing everything the same way. It it's it's true and it's not true. Here's the thing: if I say there's a monster, it looks like a hybrid between an octopus and a spider. No matter how much detail I give you past that, your brain already went, if you dislike either spiders or octopi, it doesn't matter what I say after that. Your brain has created something worse than whatever my description is going to be because you're just like, nope, nope. Nope, 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 nope. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> it's a hell beast. Just say hell beast. That's all but I does need it to have know. <laughs> well, of course it has teeth. It has teeth and a beak. Yeah. Now, I will say this, though. I, you know, just there are plenty of examples, too, where a good uh, prop or a good creature told the story. I I'll go back to John Carpenter's The Thing, right? Uh, we talk about some, some creatures and stuff. Like that versus the CGI version of The Thing two different things, right? Like the way that they did the monster in the thing, it's horrible today. I've seen that movie. I don't know how many yeah. times I've seen that movie, but the way that the, the, the creature effects were, and they were just using basically bladders to simulate like the guts and all that stuff and how it's shape shifting. Same thing with, uh, what was it? Werewolf in London, where they were using bladders on the face to make the werewolf change and stuff like that. That process there is, there's an art form to it. And I know you've done a lot of different stuff like that too. If you do it right, which you get, you know, you, which you've obviously done, it does tell the story and it does enhance the story way better than sometimes a description could be too. Yeah. But it can also really screw it up. I mean, the cool thing about, um, American werewolf in London was that transformation was all one shot. You know, they had this little apparatus that they would they would crank and the the interior would move and stretch back. And, you know, and that face was actually elongating, you know, um, most amazing thing. It'll always be probably, you know, one of the most Oscar worthy, you know, creature transformations in history. They did that in one shot. Yeah, it was all like everything was just, you know, set up so that it, it would, so that they couldn't cheat by cutting, you know, like where they would have the creature in mid transformation. And then they would kind of cut over to 
maybe a hand or something and cut back and he's mostly trans. No, they wanted this thing to transform in front of people's faces. And if you go on um, on YouTube and you kind of you know look around uh, for for the behind the scenes of that, they'll show you the mechanism, this amazing mechanism that was that was working underneath that to turn that that guy's head into uh, you know a werewolf. I mean, it was just in, it was incredible. Um, you know, uh, it will always be like probably you know the most iconic thing in my head. I, I know I'm not the only one, but I think I went off on a tangent. I forgot what we were actually talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's great. Tangents are kind of what we do anyway. Sure. <laughs> my, where my head is at is like, there are masterful ways to visually tell a story. Like I always think of uh, Alfred Hitchcock and Psycho, right? And so Psycho, you never even see Norman Bates kill. Yeah. For up until I think the last part, if I'm if I'm right, uh, it's been so long since I've seen the movie. But mostly, you just see the shadow and the da- and you know the dagger in the hand, and and so there are ways to enhance, but then show with the creatures. Yeah, my wife and I were just having a conversation. Uh, I think it, I want to say it was even last night that uh, we were talking about some of the scariest things that we had ever seen. You know, even as kids, and trying to include in you know that. And I don't remember the movie. I, I don't. But I remember this scene where um, there's a doorway, like a big archway leading from a living room into a foyer and staircase going up the stairs. And this kid, probably, I don't know, six, eight years old, goes walking to the stairs. And there's a ball that there's nobody up there, but this ball starts bouncing down the stairs. And this kid looks up the stairs and had you completely paralyzed with fear because that's what he was projecting. You didn't see and you never saw what was up those stairs. It was a ball coming down the damn stairs. And that has scarred me to the point. And now I remember why it came up because um, we were watching this uh, uh, Guillermo del Toro movie. It just came out. Shape of Water? Uh, no, not the Shape of Water. It's more. I think it's more recent. I think it's more recent. But there was a ball rolling out of nowhere to this oh, gotcha. woman and a dog. And I was like, holy shit, I remember from my childhood, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going off about the stairs, right? And you're, you're right. You don't ever see anything. And because your mind was left to terrorize yourself, God only knows what was at the top of those stairs. Crimson Peak. Is it Crimson Peak? Yeah. Yeah. It had these elements that were that were terrifyingly elegant. If that makes any sense to you, mm-hmm. there was a certain, um, um, almost day of the dead feeling to it, you mm. know, to these characters, you know, um, these, these, uh, uh ghosts that, uh, that were coming out of the, the woodwork and stuff. Um, it was really cool in that respect, but those were, those were really cool. CGI, completely CGI, clearly CGI, but we won't hold that against them. So I want to talk about pirates real quick because you did uh, some stuff for Pirates of the Caribbean. And what what specific uh, sp- uh, creature effects and special effects were you working on with that? Oh man, we okay. So the first thing you need to understand is there are thousands of people working on that project. I mean, so you know, I say yeah, I my I got the credit, it's IMDb, yay, all that stuff. I was basically on a team of people who were putting together some skeletons and stuff like that. We were rigging things up and, 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 and working on that. Um, I didn't get to work on the makeup and stuff, you know, the, the stuff that really kind of gets people's attention, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but, you know, in Hollywood's gigs, a gig, you know, <laughs> it's sure. take it. And because of the way it was shot, we kind of got credit for both films because they were kind of shot at the same time, you know, so sort of like Lord of the Rings, how. Wasn't it the last film that uh, they just shot everything at once? And yeah, you know, they, they, sh- they shoot them out of order movies. sometimes too. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I mean, it was it was it was it was it was a it was a great experience. But but basically, you don't really get to you know to do much other than your job. And then there's a lot of sit around and wait. You know, it's like thank God for the military because I learned hurry up and wait. You know, for ten years. You know, it was just. Mm-hmm. It was ingrained, so it was more of the same when I got when I got there to you know to work on that. True facts. 
Speaking of games, you have an RPG version of a comic. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about Beginnings the Rift, an Order of the Veil adventure. I've been, I've been telling, uh, trying to create this story for, it's, it's been a good 30 years now. And I st it started out as a comic book. Then I tried to, you know, uh, put it in a novel form and I, I, I couldn't focus on that. Then I put it in a script form back to the comic book. So I'm still working on the comic. I've, I've actually nearly finished the first, um, the first book. Um, and, uh, a buddy of mine about a, uh, actually it was 20. It was, um, just before COVID hit. Um, it was, uh, it was, it was January, 2020. Um, and a buddy of mine who has been trying to get me to, to, to do these, uh, you know, D and D and RPG projects, you know, just to play, you know, um, I call him up and I was like, Hey, you know, I had an idea for this, you know, I, I want to see if we could turn this into an RPG and, you know, Dave, uh, his name's Dave Knighton and, uh, Dave's all about it. And, you know, he's so we, we start putting this thing together. And um, we, so we created the first book. So we put it out on a platform called Drive Through RPG. And there it's been kind of like sitting. And, you know, we've been trying to figure out ways of promoting it, you know, and with me getting, you know, uh, booked because of the Jim Henson Creature Shop Challenge, getting booked at conventions I was like, you know, well, this is a great way, you know, for us to get it out there, you know. Um, I'm basically being paid to be there anyway, you know, why not promote, you know, the RPG? And, and so it started, and then I started thinking, it was like, I just did all this artwork for the book, you know? And so maybe I should go back to focusing on the comic book. So the RPG version comes out way before the comic book does, <laughs> but the story's still there. And, and we'll have the link in the description below. So go check that out as well. Cool. Yeah, right there, right there in the YouTube channel. If you're not listening to the YouTube, that's okay. We'll also have it on our site someplace. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Now I do have a question of the week. Excellent. Uh, we, we do a question of the week for obviously every week, hence the name. If you were going to do at a role playing table, if you were going to do a special effect to enhance the mood, what would you want to do? God, I would like to do atmosphere. I mean, you know, like it, it would depend on the situation, but, you know, dropping the temperature, you know, in the room, you know, creating some kind of, you know, nice. um, not, not so much smoke, but cold, you know, mm -hmm. it, because the temperature has dropped and that cold, you know, carbon smoke, you know, um, and, you know, some really cool, like blue lighting and stuff for the, for the proper, you know, I think that would be amazing because it adds that fourth dimension to, you know, what you're doing. About to kill a white dragon and you've got dry Just, ice all oh, over the room. Yeah. The AC's on. That would be awesome. You it'd get the be, blue light. It'd be really nice if you actually, if you just had uh, fans and coolers so that oh, yeah. you could hit a button and actually release the cold. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I wouldn't even do, I'd do it from underneath the table because, I mean, the less sure. people can see what's coming, the better. Yeah. And there was this nightclub in uh, Las Vegas years ago. Um, I think it was called Club Ice. And on the floor, they had this uh, uh, carbon dioxide machine, dry ice machine. It was huge. And it would blow out cold air to the point where it's getting that smoke, that same, you know, that same effect, um, right. you know, the dry ice effect. Uh, but it would literally lower the temperature like 25 degrees in the club. So when people are dancing, they would put this thing on um, and it would, you never knew when it was going to go off. It would just go off and the whole nice. freaking room would just drop like 25 degrees. Smoke would come off the bodies because they've been dancing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's cool. It was just the coolest thing. And I think adding something like that underneath, I mean, to to just release it in a way that number one, didn't spook any of the players because of the fact that, you know, you, you want them to stay seated and not turn over the damn table, you know, when they're <laughs> freaking out about the cold. But if I had my, you know, my way, I would, you know, somehow release that under the table and, you know, and just maybe some ice sound effects in the background. That's you know, that, fantastic. Yeah. Nice. That breaking glass kind of, you know, I think that would be cool. That would be very cool. What about you, Eric? 
I would do smell. That's going to be yeah. the atmospheric effect. I would have various scents that maybe I've collected if I knew that we were coming out. So we'll say volcano, right? You're, you're going to fight a red dragon in a nice volcanic caldera. Then maybe I would have uh, the scent of some kind of burnt flesh, right? Because, you know, there's got to be some dead bodies lying around. Yeah. Maybe that smell of fire, you know, that, that, that almost that stark smell of fire where it's maybe kick the heater, maybe have a heater directly underneath the uh, table. Maybe I'll set the table on fire and, <laughs> and see what people do about that. I wouldn't do that. But I might have like maybe some burnt leaf smell. Or, I don't know. Something interesting about that because smell and memory are very closely linked. Uh, yeah. And so I think that would be really interesting. Matt, what about you? We've, already, we've gotten kind of environment touch and feel. We've got smell. What are you going for? As is our way. I've got a couple of different answers. Of course. One, if I were setting up like a ritual type situation... You pull the wicks out of the candles, do half of them as color flame wicks, and then pull them back through so that you've basically got a timer. And as you're telling the story, the candles are burning down. You know that they're about to change color, but nobody else at the table does. Oh, that's cool. Nice. That would be great for 10 candles, too, which if you haven't heard of this, Russ, it's a game where you literally sit in the dark and 10 candles and you tell ghost stories about the end of the world. And then whenever someone rolls and they fail, you take a candle out and they're dead until you sit in the, alone in the room with your friends with one That's candle until awesome. the light goes out. I've never heard of that. It's, it is a creepy ass game. It's wonderful. You should check that out. You start out with a bunch of extra dice based off of how, much, how many candles you have. And as you lose candles, the DM gain, or you lose candles, you lose dice and the DM gains the dice to use oh, wow. against you so it only gets worse <laughs> that's fantastic as life you know <laughs> that's exactly right yeah just only like gets life. Hurt. you know i i love scents i like cooking and uh playing with taste if there were a way to uh, there are ways to actually aerosolize flavors so you start talking about, you know, going into the bar and like a big steaming plate of food hits the table. And then, you know, you aerosolize a little bacon flavor and some stuff like so that you can literally taste it like you're there. So you're up there with like a little mister just pss, 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 spraying people. I don't know. <laughs> I'd have an atomizer off to the side and hit a button so they wouldn't know it was coming. That's cool. Yeah. That is all like, you know, like uh, copper. Because, I mean, the, you know, you get that taste in your mouth. If there's enough blood, you, know, yep. you can actually, yeah. you know, taste it. And, and then you smell that copper smell. And that's the smell of blood. I mean, that, that would freak a lot of people out. That would be great for a horror game. Like have yeah, just like a know, copper scent. While we're talking about that, it, it always kind of like when you're, when you're watching a horror movie, specifically like zombies and stuff. You know, everyone's trying to race around, trying to get the get away from them or control the population. Some no one really dives into what that smells like. You know, I mean, you're talking about a mass amount of rot and decay. Oh, and yeah. no one's gagging when this is going on. No one's like throwing up or, you know, you know, trying to hold back so much that they've got snot running out of their face. I mean. That's, I think, the reality of it. You know, I mean, sure. sort of like the games, like we're talking about, you know, it's almost like, you know, I wish, you know, smell a vision was a thing, you know. So when they were, when they're chased and chased by these creatures, I mean, there is that smell. I, I wondered why no one has ever, to my knowledge, you know, tried to, to create that. You know, I mean, that would be because of zombie movies. No, there you go. That would yeah. stink. Right <laughs> think about the cooking shows. Oh my god! You know, I mean, yeah. But then there's also porn, and I don't know if I want that smelling <laughs> oh, yeah, in my house good, the whole time. That's a good, yeah, that's a good, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. You just, yeah. I mean, now, now that's yeah. now that's gonna yeah, be stuck in my head all friend, night. Yeah. You, you know, you watch the porn the night before. Your friends come over to your house, and they're like, "Why does it smell like bleach in here?" Yeah, what's going on here? Yeah, what is it? Yeah, it's, <laughs> Russ, where can interested folks go to get more info? Basically, I mean, uh, you can uh, check me out on uh, TikTok. I'm always doing um, how-to videos. And uh, right now, as I learn the comic book you know, process, 
Um, I'm doing all these videos from a complete novice, you know, idiot's perspective, you know, after doing a year's worth of research, trying to make sure that I do it right. Um, and so if you go to TikTok, it's just uh, Russ Adams official. And that, that that's how they can get me there. Facebook, I'm popping in and out of there from time to time. Um, that's just just look up Russ Adams and you'll see my my nasty little mug there. I've got a website. Um, uh, escape, uh, design and the letters fx.com. Um, thinking we're probably going to do some revamping on that. So if you do check it out and it's down, it's probably just being, you know, revamped, um, cause it's, it's getting dated, <laughs> you know? Uh, but yeah, those are, those are the big ones. Um, I've tried Instagram and stuff like that. I just cannot make that work, man. I, I can't make Twitter work. I can't make Instagram. Work. I don't know how people do that. More power to them. That's a great question. <laughs> i'm active on twitter but i don't know that it's working <laughs> yeah yeah russ adams is an fx artist and creature designer and founder of escape design fx russ it's been a pleasure we've had a blast thanks so much for being on our show thanks guys i really appreciate it any questions or comments hit us up at goblins corner on twitter did you like this interview we hope so subscribe to the podcast on your favorite player youtube or twitch Click the five stars and give us a review on iTunes and Podchaser. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe button. It helps get our show in front of more people. It boosts the show and it feeds the hungry algorithm. Which is currently a 42-inch minotaur made of EVA foam creeping up from behind. That's all the time we have for tonight. Once again, my name is Eric. And I'm Matt. We'll see you next time. Good night, folks. Goblin's Corner is written and produced by Eric Holden and Matt Staples. Show song by the mighty D20. Don't we love that guy? This is a subterranean production.